Most of the questions are about relationships, fortunately not personal ones. Uh, uh, first is relationship to your readers. Uh, how much do you take your reader into account? How much do you think about your reader as you're writing? Uh, how often are you afraid that you may be stepping over the boundary with readers <coughs> expecting too much from them or demanding too much? David, do you want to? Well, this I is a subject first. you and I have discussed many times, <laughs> uh, actually. I, I don't know. I don't know. The, one of many reasons for being terrified about this sort of venue is that a lot of the stuff, it sort of feels like it's not in my interest to think about, think, think. Um, I know that if stuff is going well, it feels like I'm talking to somebody or like there's somebody there. And I think it's somebody ra rather suspiciously like me. Uh, uh, and, and I know, I, you know, it, it's a very charitable way to put it. Are you making too high demands on stuff? I know I run into problems with, you know, irritation thresholds, um, cost benefit flux, and all kinds of stuff. And my, um, I don't, I, get, I, guess, I guess the deal that I've made with myself is I, I don't think about it a whole lot when I'm working, but I've got a, a, a little set of, of three or four um, readers, only one of whom is a relative, uh, who've, been, who, who, who've graciously been reading for me, you know, for 15 years and are, are fairly blunt about when irritation thresholds or gratuitousness thresholds seem to be um, exceeded. Um, and uh, I, think, I think I lean on them in in the respect that it allows me not really to think about it very much when I'm doing it, which of course doesn't yield a very interesting answer. <laughs> I'll come hence, back to our hence, ongoing hence argument the about thing this. about the outside readers, which is the only nugget I really have to offer. Uh, Rick? This came up at breakfast. <clears throat> uh, Michael Silverblatt had, had used a line with regard to, to another writer that, that his books would have been much better had he completely discounted their effect or, or, or ceased to think about their effect on, on his readership. And it's, it, it's, it was such a, it's a strange and wonderful formulation. And I've been turning it over in my head all day. I, I, I guess finally, it, is, it, it, it seems to me almost inconceivable that you would not be gauging the effect of the work upon some re receiver. The question is who? Uh, it, it's, not, it, it's not a question of, of, of whether you're, you're writing without mindfulness or, or, or uh, creating a transmission w without a reception. The, the, the question is, who is the ideal reader? Is this a stable configuration? Is this perpetually reinvented as in, in, in the light of the, 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 the many, many needs that a, a, a novel will present? Um, I, I think it's a good exercise uh, at, at various points in, in, the, in the creative process. to reach out towards something antithetical to your own ideal reception. I mean, I, I agree with David. I think in, in some ways my ideal reader does look like me, at least during the uh, first draft, the, the, the invention part of the process. I think in, 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 at different moments in revision, I will work hard to see what, what this would look like uh, from someone who's very much not me. If it's pleasing you, do you assume it's going to please others? Oh, that's that's a horrible assumption. I mean, <laughs> the, the 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 assumption that that um, that pleasure can be calculated at all in advance is is a very difficult one. Although, if it's pleasing enough, you just don't care, which is nice. <laughs> and then, if by chance people do like it, it seems like this wonderful bit of frosting. Can you can you do mm. that? You can get to a level of personal pleasure where you you you, you essentially. Yeah, we're still. I thought implicitly we were talking early draft stuff. Okay. Then there's the horrible <laughs> right. dash of cold water when you realize somebody else is going to see this. And, yeah. Yeah. So the next level of this, or maybe it's pre-level, relationship with editors. 
Uh, to what degrees are they helps, hindrances, learning from? Uh, you know, I can honestly say I do not think of my current editor as a reader at all. Um, and I, you know, I, don't say, I, I don't say that to be flip because I, I, I know that, that you know, his reading will have everything to do with what happens to the book as it attempts to make its way in the world. Um, and I'm always surprised by what he has to say. I simply don't conceive of him as, a, as, a, as a, uh, uh, an active presence in the, in the making. Does he have a lot to say? Do you pay attention? You know, John told us in the van on the way here that one of his favorite pedagogical techniques when a student asks him a question that he doesn't want to answer is to answer something else. Uh, <laughs> I uh, mentioned that, huh? <laughs> I, I, I think that's varied quite a bit from book to book. Um, I think it would be pretty rare in commercial publishing now to get a real hands-on, you know, uh, to Max Perkins kind of read from a from a literary editor. I I we're very different in this respect. I um, I don't think I again. This is going to sound like real really editorial sucking up. Um, I got I've got an editor who's made the last I guess four things that he's worked on with me better. And he's not part of the first screen of readers because he's an authority figure and da 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 da, da so you want to make sure. It's weird. He and I, when it gets, when it gets to his point, I'll, I'll spend nine months sending him letters begging him for editorial help. Then by the time he gets the manuscript, I will have already, you know, I, I will be done, I will have been done with it. It'll, it will have gone to other readers. I will have, like, worked out my response to that and I will be... So what he gets, I am so reptilianly attached to that that the poor guy gets all these letters, which I'm sure he just throws away. And then we begin to fight about the manuscript. And he I, he hasn't been my editor all through all the books, but he's been like the editor on the last four. And the last fiction book, I mean, Rick and I were just talking. It's very dark back there, and we were whispering about um, uh, brief interviews with hideous men. The order of the things that I had sent him was utterly different than the order that's in the book. And he, he made the arrangement that's in the book, that's, and it's about 450%, well, I've already convinced you, about 450% better than what it was. And uh, um, I don't, yeah, I'm just grateful. Anyway, um, and, I, and, I, and I know that I'm unusual, and um, the, poor, the guy puts up with a lot of neurosis and mixed messages, but I've, I've actually come to lean on him, which I'm not supposed to say, because then if the editor knows he's got you, then... <laughs> we'll be we'll be talking about the editing of this, I guess. Well, this has been a semi argument between us. Uh, in the first form of it was my insisting that uh, the writer didn't know anything to the reader except to write uh, as well as he or she could, and forget about the reader. You then convinced me of the opposite, using I think a story from Michael Peach that uh, nobody had an obligation to. Uh, buy a book, pick it off a shelf in a bookstore, but they weren't obligated to go on. And so having convinced me of that, the next time we talked about it, you took the opposite position and then proceeded to convince me of the opposite. And where do we stand now? Uh, well, I've used your first argument many times with authors I've dealt with, that it's much more like a conversation that you're having. and. Uh, uh, neither an editor or a reader has any obligation to continue to listen unless you're being interesting. Well, both, obviously both op obligation and interesting could, would take a lot of unpacking that I don't think probably anybody here is interested in. But. <laughs> I, don't, I don't get what that would mean, a writer owes nothing to, to the reader. I mean, I Do what he or she feels as though they want to do. And whatever group of readers there may be, small, large, they're going to get it or they won't get it. But don't this consider. This was my original it. position. That was my original. No, that position. was mine. Ah. And you argued against it. I good for me. And convinced me. But then you took the opposite <laughs> position. But do do I guess the, the way that I would try to reconcile those positions is to say that do whatever you think you feel is necessary means locate in this process a or a series of ideal readers. Or there's even a more bit, you know, and this is probably 
who cares if it's boring? It just I've been thinking, and Rick and I have been talking a lot about teaching, and there's this fundamental difference that's, that comes up in freshman comp and haunts you all the way through teaching undergrads is, is that there's a, a fundamental difference between expressive writing and communicative writing. And, and one of the biggest problems, like in terms of learning to write or teaching anybody to write, is getting it in your nerve endings that the reader cannot read your mind. You know, that, that what you say isn't interesting simply because you yourself say it. Whether that translates to, to, a, to a feeling of obligation to the reader, I, I don't know. But, but we've all probably sat next to people at dinner or on public transport who are, who, who are producing, you know, communication signals, but it, it's, not, it's not communicative expression. It's, it's expressive expression, right? And, 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 and actually it's in conversation that, that you can feel most vividly how, how alienating and unpleasant it is to feel as if somebody is going through all the motions of communicating with you, but in fact, you don't even need to be there at all. <laughs> mm -hmm. Could this be a third <laughs> this, different this, point? I'll here? think about this one. What about relationship with reviewers? Uh, most writers go through various stages. They pay attention, read them seriously at the beginning, uh, grow to hate them, stop reading them or drive themselves crazy by continuing to read them. Do either of you read them? Do you read them all? Does somebody uh, edit them for you? <laughs> Michael, do it. No, it's not that full service. <laughs> Go ahead and you can. I, I, I do read them. Uh, I don't believe the good ones. I, I, I agonize over the bad ones. And a, a, a review can say, this is the, the, the most astonishing book I've read for years and years. Um, uh, I, I, I wish you know, that, that uh, it, you know, it, it, had, it, it had had a few more peaks and not so many valleys. And I'd be worried about you know, the little cavil. You know. Um, you know, but I, I think saying that, I, I would also say at the same time, I am entirely indifferent to them. So there's a, there there are two paradoxical modes, one in which I really I, I really want a kind of return communication in the face of what I've just been doing for the last three years, and the second, which is somewhat in, indifferent to that and, and uh, capable, rightly or wrongly, of convincing myself that uh, uh, there are other more satisfying conversations going on there. I'm just not hearing the return. When they get to the part of the however. Are you more inclined to believe that? Oh, I, I don't think there's, I, I don't think my belief, the, the visceral belief in the moment of reading the review ever filters into the writing process. Yeah. I mean, I don't think, I simply don't think you can write more than one novel in this country and uh, n not have managed to, to, to create a, a, a fundamental imperviousness to, to reception. <coughs> David? No, well, um, <laughs> I, I, I don't read them as, as a matter of, of practice. I have, um, I'm fairly disciplined as long as they're in the organ. Um, if somebody mails it to me, very often I slip up and, and read them. And I am not indifferent to them. And they're, they are extremely upsetting uh, to me. And... Um, not that they shouldn't exist. You, you know what? I, I have an analogy, but it's somewhat off color. Um, and it involves, we, we got to go in, um, and listen to a research presentation at the Santa Fe Institute this afternoon. And, uh, um, and afterwards, there was a restroom break, and people were using the restroom. And because certain parts of the restrooms were occupied, I was in, I was in a stall, but I was not in a stall. I was going, there I was in a stall, and and there are two guys out in the in the in the bathroom, and and one says, yeah, so you know who who are those who are those guys? And I don't know a couple of writers and all that. And then right away, I was in the position that I am in when I'm contemplating reading a review, which is it is incredibly tempting to want to listen to this, but it messes you up every time because it is a it's a special communication between between the reviewer is talking to potential book buyers or people who bought the book and you know want to want to um, want to get their own reactions checked and it is not a communication that includes the author I don't think oh it can 
Uh, it can't. I mean, there are good faith reviews and there are bad faith reviews. I, I, for, for me, and, and could you poke holes in this? Yes. Would I prefer that you didn't? No. I mean, yes, because because uh, because this is a protection mechanism. I've just decided that this is like this is like this is like people talking at a, about you somewhere, and you're in a position to eavesdrop. And if you do, by all means, go ahead and do. But mm. we all know what happens, right? Sitcom plots revolve <laughs> around what happens, and so um, it, and. Um, is it, is it a shaky idea? Yeah. Um, would I prefer to be impervious to them? Yeah, I'm not. And it just helps me to pretend that they're not going on. Though I have, you know, the Japanese lady haunts my dreams. So <laughs> <laughs> I was going to avoid all. mentioning that name. The, uh, you don't, neither of you has to answer this one. Is there any sense of uh, reviewers waiting in the bushes after your first few novels? <laughs> to suggest you're not as good as others have thought you've been? Certainly you don't have to answer this. Else I can answer it for you. Oh, I'm sorry? The reviewers You mean the same who reviewer who has received you well early on has decided... Not the that, same ones, but others. Okay. Who, uh, well, can, can, can I rephrase the question and say, um, does the reviewing process become a different thing at different stages in a career? Yeah. And which I guess in some ways suggests that the act of reviewing isn't a good faith process because it's reviewing a narrative about you rather than the words between covers. Mm -hmm. What are your thoughts on reviewers, John? <laughs> Generally? Yeah. Dumb, self-indulgent, uh, more talking about Don't themselves. pull any punches. <laughs> And uh, I don't have to worry about the reviews. I can even identify the Daily Reviewer for the New York Times as being the prime example of such things. The, um, what about scholarly articles? Now, given the state of academia, there haven't been a great number written on either of you. Uh, do you read them, and how do they affect you? Do you take them seriously? So the ones who are really attempting to... Uh, do something more serious than what a 500, 700 uh, word book review can do. God's honest truth. I've read a few, you know, sometimes people send them to you. I've read them. I, I've, I've read a few. Don't understand them. <laughs> okay. No, I mean, like, can't, can't follow the argument, cannot see, cannot see in my, in my version of the text any of the stuff they see. Sometimes they're very impressive in a kind of, I wonder what on earth he's talking about. <laughs> so those I don't have any problem with. <laughs> and it's not a joke. That is, that is the cold truth. I, I do not understand. Richard, you've had some of these. Yeah, and I, I, I enjoy reading them in, in the way that I enjoy reading scholarly articles about, about other contemporary novels. They seem part of a conversation that in a way that daily reviewing can't afford to be or, or doesn't you know, have, have the time or the energy to be, part of an ongoing conversation about what books do and what has come before. Do they seem to be less about you than reviews might be? Clearly, yeah. yeah. Uh, why do you write? So a lot of people don't write. You two do write. A number of other novelists, other people do write. Uh, why? Why not stop? Sounds you, good to me. Yeah, I never thought about that. <laughs> John, is there some way to rephrase it so it's less cruel? That's so. Uh, that, I don't such mean a it that way. It's such You're a general question this. that it's difficult not just to babble. So is it compulsive? There's no choice? Uh, you know, in, 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 in a sense, any answer to that question is going to be a narrative overlay. It's going to be a fabrication. Um, and, and it's going to be an attempt to, to add to the, the narrative explanation of self that the writing is anyway. Um, I, I, I write out of pleasure, and every morning I, I can't believe I'm getting away with this. And, I, you know, th that sort of deep puritanical sense that this is a zero-sum game, you know, leads me to believe that, you know, I've got 20 lean years to come. Um, 
but uh, it's you 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 write to enhance your pleasure in life and to to, to in, increase your sense of where you are and uh, where you've been dropped down. You really get up every morning and you feel just incredibly lucky every day. Oh, I, I mean, what what other career affords you that? Oh, I'm not arguing. I'm just I'm in awe. I mean, I, I would like I would, I just like to be that healthy between my ears because. And no, I, this isn't a setup or anything. Yeah. And, um, well, I just sometimes, sometimes, yeah, and sometimes it just you know, oh my God, it's like the back of my hand stapled to my forehead. But you're not yeah. saying I'd rather I'd rather be piling boxes up. No. I mean, Franzen's got a, John Franzen's got a real good one about this because he gets asked this a lot. And he, he says, yeah, there's the bullshit narrative overlay. And then the truth is because there's nothing else I want to do. Mm. And um, my own narrative overlay is just something that I've always liked that's in Oliver. Except this is going to make it sound nobler or more compulsive than it is. Um, but there's this thing in Oliver Sacks, and it might, it might be in The Man Who Mistook His Wife for a Hat, about... I think it's. I think it was a bag lady who was teretic, and I'll bet other people remember this. But she'd stand on a street corner, maybe like New York or L.A. or something, and, you know, thousands of passersby going by, you know, and she'd just stand there and wouldn't do anything. But then after maybe five or ten minutes, after a certain number of passersby had gone by, she would go back into an alley and mm. um, ex express somehow every face. And, and according to Sachs, it was like eerie. You know, it was like eerie. It, was, it wasn't just the faces, it was the people who mm. go by. Mm. And, um, and then we, she would go up back out and stay. And there's something about, I, I resonate with something mm. about that, although I wouldn't claim it's this romantic, you know, but some are just driven and yeah. born and, and compelled to do it. But it's, there is a kind of... Yeah. There's a, there's a corollary to that, <laughs> as a sort of footnote to that, and as a response to the Franzen's formulation. Um, for me, there are plenty of other things that I, I, I would love to spend time doing. Writing is the only place where you can do them all. Are you coming down on the side? And I've heard a lot of writers say, it, David, of uh, they wish they didn't have to do it, that it's a painful process. Half the half the time, yeah, and ha but the other half of the time, you're like, how could I ever, ever have stopped? You know, thanking the ceiling all the time for getting for being able to do this. I just, you know. I want, and again, narrative overlay, whatever, um, was in a restaurant, this was years ago, and overheard two guys talking about how hard their jobs were and how they felt like their creativity was one thing, but then they, there, was, there was the constant pressure and that the industry was always changing and that um, their sense, you know, that they couldn't rely on their sense of, of, of what the person they were making their stuff for was gonna um, was gonna think, and they were terrified that they were gonna get fired, but also praying they were gonna get fired because they just couldn't take this. And I, event I don't do this often, but eventually, because I figured, right, they were part of the the few, the proud. They were upholsterers. Mm -hmm. uh, they were furniture upholsterers, and I swear to God, word for word, the conversation was. I don't know. So so I I guess I sort of think that um, there's not anything. Within a certain kind of broad genus of certain kinds of jobs, we were talking about this with scientists at the Santa Fe Institute. I don't think it's substantively different, at least for me, than most other jobs would be. If you were the sort of person who could be grateful in any sort of job, then I just, yeah. I just, I wish I were you. I've heard that on this on this question of of, of agony, that it genders strongly, and that women novelists tend to you know tend to be filled with religious gratitude, and, and men like to bitch and moan. <laughs> What's the pleasure of writing? What pleasure do you derive? Except the weird thing is, is it's both at the same time. Mm. I mean, it's, and the weird thing for me, having done it for a while, I almost can't imagine one without the other. No, it's, I don't know. Getting in touch Sorry. with your in, in, inner feminine side and then... I don't think I've had any trouble <laughs> getting in touch with my inner feminine side. So tell me your pleasure. For me, it's connection. Uh, it, it would be the, the pleasure of, a, of an expansive, long-ranging dinner conversation with people who do all sorts of things uh, and being able to come back to that night after night and, and pick up threads and, and, and follow them. Um, there's, a, there's a voyeuristic pleasure. Um, there's a synthetic pleasure. But primarily, it's, it's, it's the pleasure of being able to live in a frame of time that the rest of life conspires to annihilate.
So it's the time that you're writing? It's, 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 I guess, ideally, and on the very, the very best days, it's no time at all. It's, it's simply breaking uh, the, the constraints of, of time and, and physical constraint. It's a beautiful way to put it. My experience of it is just the, the good days are when you look up and it's just way later than you thought it could be. You know, and those are the good days. And way I, later by the clock and yeah. in some sort of inner... And, and I, there's a, when it goes well, there's a, there's a way you're tired that's a, just a really good way. It's just a, a really good kind of tired. Thanks very much. Thank you, David. Thank you, Richard. Thank you, John. Thank you, Richard. Thank you.